All right, hello everyone. This is Ray. Um, today I'm here with Josh Galicki as well. Uh, say hello, Josh. Hey, everybody. Um, Josh is a great photographer that I have had the privilege to know online for a while, but I um, uh, haven't shot together too much yet, so that's something that should be coming shortly. But um, he is a Canon shooter. I'm a Nikon shooter, so you'll get a good mix of both sides in today's discussion. And today we're going to talk about exposure theory and how it applies to wildlife photography. So, um, you know, we're going to cover a range of topics as far as, um, you know, different metering methods, camera settings, and then just some theory to think about as far as uh, actual lighting conditions and how to kind of see them and apply them and hopefully walk away with really good well exposed photos so you have less to do fixing things in post uh, even though that is probably a big part of it for most of us wildlife photography is um, you know always changing and we don't always have the time to really dial things in perfectly but the goal with today's discussion is to get you as close as possible as often as possible um, so let's get started. Uh, we're just going to jump right in here. And the first thing we kind of wanted to discuss is um, our preferred metering mode. So uh, for Nikon shooters out there, the metering mode that I like to use is the 3D matrix metering mode. And um, it's kind of Nikon's version of an overall uh, metering. So it's not real specific to a certain area in the photo. It takes into account everything in the image. And from what I understand, it actually takes into account even color in the image and uh, focus distance when it has lenses that can actually incorporate that. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Josh here. I know I'm pretty sure the Canon side is called evaluative metering, and uh, I'll let him talk about uh, why he uses that on the Canon side. Yeah, that's exactly right, Ray. That's what it's called. And by the way, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Certainly. And I think this will be a really good discussion. Yeah, for Canon, it's the evaluative metering. And essentially what it does is it meters the entire scene versus a, a specific portion of the frame like you would have in spot metering, and it has a more gen it has a stronger focus uh, toward the center of the frame. Yeah, perfect. Um, and then before we get any further, I do want to mention, I know Josh and I both talked about this and we both have the same point of view here. Uh, all the information we're going to give you guys today is our preferred method. Uh, it's definitely methods that I think we've both kind of honed over the years of, you know, trial and error. Uh, but please keep in mind, if you do something differently and it works for you, definitely stick with that because whatever we say certainly isn't gospel. It's just what we like to use and what we found has worked well for us in the field. Yep. All right, cool. So, um, so metering mode. So we both kind of use the overall metering, but I do know. I, I want to mention. I do know a bunch of shooters that love spot metering for wildlife. Um, I personally have one issue I found with that, and I'll actually show some example images when we get into this a little bit further. Um, and that main issue I have is spot metering is so sensitive to that one specific spot that if your frame, if your focus point or that spot metering area is a little bit off of your subject, it can dramatically change your exposure. Or even if you're in manual exposure, it can change what your camera is telling you through the meter. And that can really kind of wreak, uh, wreak havoc with, um, you know, uh, really dramatic images, especially if the subject is light and the background is dark or vice versa. Uh, if that spot meter gets off of it just a little bit, your meter can go crazy. And um, I've found that to be kind of tough sometimes. That being said, I do know a ton of people that really like um, to use spot meter and it works well for them. So next, uh, we're going to kind of move on to a little bit of the camera settings on the back. And for this, I'm going to switch over to Josh's screen and just kind of hand it off to him. So uh, there you go, Josh, if you want to start talking about the highlight alert. Great. Thanks, Ray. And, you know, let me just talk about exposure in general. When it comes to getting a proper exposure it's actually very easy it's not rocket science especially with digital these days so the first thing that i do when i pick up a camera if i buy a new camera body and i'm ready to go on a shoot i go to the back of the camera and there's a thing for canon shooters it's one of the blue menus it's called a highlight alert i enable the highlight alert and essentially what that does when you're taking a photo if you have an image that's overexposed in the photo it'll generate blinkies in the back of the screen. And here's an example, actually. This is the back of a Canon uh, body. You see an exposure, and you can see that that blackness on the top. It will, it will actually blink it on flashes, the back of your... Yeah. Yep, and um, it essentially tells you that that portion of the exposure is overexposed. So 
Um, how do you know what a proper exposure is? When you see those blinkies, what do you need to do? Well, it's actually very simple. Um, what my preferred method to do is I do what a lot of photographers uh, call exposed to the right. That's the common lingo these days. When you take, um, I'll take a test shot or a test exposure, I'll hit the playback button in the back of the camera for Canon and I hit the info button and I'm able to see the histogram. And right here is an example of a histogram. Uh, there's five boxes. If you look at the histogram, the leftmost box are your darkest tones. Those are, t those are shadows and the like. All the way to the right are your lightest tones or your highlights. Mid-tones are in the middle, of course. So the whole point of it is to make sure that you have a smattering of data in the rightmost box, which is the, the fifth box to the right, and you don't clip it. Um, if, for instance, you're looking at this exposure here, you have data in the rightmost box, this is more, generally speaking, what people would call a proper exposure. Your highlights are not overexposed, and this one, if, the, if there is a photo associated with it, you would not have any blinkies. You can see there's a, a lot of midtones as well. You can also use, by the way, a histogram to tell whether or not you have high contrast or low contrast in your exposure. Um, if there's um, a significant amount of data in your darkest tones and a significant amount of data in your lightest tones, i.e. to the left and to the right, then you would have an, a, a photo that has high contrast. So why is it important to expose to the right as much as possible? Uh, and by the way, here's some examples of photos looking at the histograms that are exposed. Um, the first one to the left here is underexposed. You'll see you have the majority of your data to the left. You have one that's the proper exposure in the middle. As you can see, you have uh, data that goes all the way to the right, but it's not clipped, if you'll notice. Um, it doesn't clip to the right. So therefore, you could see the sample image above. You don't have anything blown out, if you will. And to the right, you have a histogram that's severely overexposed. You could see all of the data is clipped to the right. And of course, that reflects in the image above when you look at the sky that's blown out. One thing to note, why you want to get a proper exposure. A lot of folks will tell me, well, you know, I, I, I didn't move it all the way to the right, but it was fine. I'll open it up and whether it's Lightroom, I'll open it up by increasing brightness or the exposure uh, settings in Lightroom or Photoshop and post-processing. And you can do that, but what you're doing, you're introducing a lot of noise to the image or a decent amount of noise that you don't want. When you properly expose and you don't have to open up the brightness in post, you're not going to introduce that noise. And I always rely on my histogram. The reason is a lot of people will look at the back of an LCD and they'll look at the, the photo and they'll kind of gear it, okay, this looks good or this doesn't look good. But um, think about times when it's very sunny outside and you, kind of, you can't even really see the LCD screen well. Um, the histogram speaks for itself when you look at the data. So this is my go-to method in terms of finding what a proper exposure is. So it's fairly simple. Um, if I have an image, I'll take a test image and it's underexposed, that means I have to open it up a little more. I can slow my shutter speed down, I can raise my ISO, whatever tool I have between my aperture and my shutter speed and my ISO, I can adjust one or multiple uh, settings to make sure that I expose to the right. And once you have that exposure, you're good to go as, as long as the lighting conditions remain the same. And if they change, you make those adjustments. Yeah, excellent. Um, there's a few comments now that came in, so I just want to uh, talk about those real quick. Uh, Christian Hanold did mention um, that uh, with the newer cameras, uh, having the correct exposure isn't quite as important anymore. And while I would agree with that, you definitely can push these files around a lot more. Uh, obviously having the closest to the best exposure uh, right off the bat is definitely a helpful thing. Um, you know, less color correcting, um, more consistent uh, look to the image and better quality overall from less uh, photo manipulation and post are all definitely a good thing. Can the files take it? Certainly. So, you know, um, don't think that you, if, if your exposure is a little bit off in the field, that you have to just immediately trash that photo. You certainly can correct that, but, uh, you know, hopefully using some of the techniques we're going to talk about today to get uh, closer to the most correct exposure can help you to start out with. Uh, and that would apply to the um, 
noise that uh, you just mentioned as well, Josh, uh, that you know some of these newer sensors can handle pushing the images around and being under or overexposed a little bit more, but obviously having uh, closer to the correct exposure right off the bat is a good thing. And then, yeah. um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, I, I totally agree. In some cases, I've had photos that are they're excellent and I want to keep them, and there's a few blinkies on there, but you could recover that in post-processing by bringing down the highlights and the like. Sure. Um, yeah, that's 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 a great point that Christian made. And then uh, Alejandro asked, um, let's see, let me just scroll back up to the question here. She said, uh, does Nikon have anything like that? She always exposures, uh, overexposes stuff. Yeah, I think she was talking about the highlight blinkies. And uh, Alejandro, yes, they do. So in Nikon, cameras it's under the Nikon playback display options there is an option to turn on the histogram as well as um, the option to turn on the highlights which will kind of give you those blinking overexposed areas uh, so that is definitely something that you can turn on on Nikon and then I think there was a question I'll see the comment right now but someone had asked what exactly is metering they weren't really sure so uh, basically metering is uh, the camera has some built-in tools to kind of uh, measure the light that's in the scene. So it measures the light coming in through your lens and the meter is usually visible in the bottom of the viewfinder when you're looking through it or the side depending on the, the camera setup. Um, but it's basically like a bar. So there's usually a uh, proper exposure in the middle. So your goal usually is to get the meter in the middle um, and then it will tell you if it's too light or too dark. Um, in manual mode, exposure mode, which we'll talk about in a moment here, uh, you kind of um, change settings to move that meter around and get it where you want it. Uh, whereas in automatic mode, such as aperture priority, shutter priority, and program, the camera actually uses the information gathered from that exposure meter to guess the exposure and set the camera for you. So that's what metering is, to, just to answer that question. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll mention, Ray, um, at least for Canon, when you have sun and you're in the golden hour, you're past the golden hour and you're on a, you're in a sunny day, the meter is fairly smart. Mm -hmm. When it's cloudy and you're in conditions that are not sunny, the meter can be dumb. So you have to push exposure, if, for instance, on cloudy days. And we could talk a little bit about that as we move on with some of the scenarios. Yeah, one, one more question. Edwin says, a little off topic, but what do you do when you're frustrated with your photography? So he says, not finding subjects you want to shoot, consistently getting bad light. Uh, Edwin, my best um, advice is to just get out there more often. Uh, we all go through that period of frustration. Um, I've had some of my favorite months this past year, and then I've had almost what I felt like were uh, a two-month period where I didn't walk away with any good images worth really sharing. So, you know, it definitely happens. Just keep going out there uh, and get out there more. And also just remember to enjoy being out in nature. That's kind of a big part of doing this. Um, and one thing, yeah, yeah. depending upon, you know, your, your job or the availability, some people can't shoot until, you know, it's a certain time of day. And even if it's past the golden hour and you have to shoot, I don't know, 9, 10 a.m. because you're working a job, you're on a third shift or whatever, um, you know, look for the right lighting conditions. If you have to shoot midday or later in the day, but you can't shoot in the evening close to sunset, find a day where it's cloudy and you can shoot. So Perfect you can shoot example. throughout the day. It just depends on the, light, the lighting conditions. Yeah, certainly. So let's talk about the um, exposure mode that we use. So uh, I think both you and I mainly shoot in manual exposure mode, correct, Josh? Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Um, so le I'll let you talk a little bit about that because I also use aperture priority and auto ISO. So I'll let you start with manual and then I'll just throw in my aperture uh, priority auto ISO settings after that. Great, yeah. Um, so I typically shoot in manual mode unless I'm trying to do something specific. Um, I'll use shutter priority, for instance, if I want to do an artistic blur, for instance, and all I care about really is the shutter speed for the most part. But in many cases, when it comes to wildlife, I shoot in manual mode, and essentially what that is is uh, you have the uh, ability to uh, set your shutter, your aperture, and your ISO. Um, so you have full control, control over the exposure um, with your camera. The reason why I like to do this when it comes to wildlife is I like to expose for the subject. When I expose for the subject and I set my exposure, if, for instance, birds are a great example, if you have a bird that's flying against the blue sky 
and it dips down and let's say there's, you know, you have green mountains below the metering on the camera. If you were in an automatic mode, like aperture priority, the metering would get all screwed up and you would actually lose a lot of good frames when you expose for the bird and you have those settings locked in the camera, whether your bird is flying against the blue sky or whether it dips below and it's flying in front of a tree line, you're going to get consistent shots or consistent exposures of that bird and it'll be properly exposed every time. So that's my preference when it comes to wildlife is to shoot in manual mode. Uh, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I completely agree. So while you were talking about that, I was showing some examples on my computer of those exact scenarios where um, the subject is actually a, a big exposure difference from the background. So uh, shooting these in manual mode is a perfect scenario for where it would actually kind of fail um, if I was using one of the automatic exposure modes. So, uh, But the other mode that I will use, and I'll just switch over to my screen real quick for you guys here, is aperture priority and auto ISO. And when I use that is in scenarios where I am walking around the, the woods or a park or something like that, and I'm not sure where my set is going to be. So uh, it's more when I'm kind of doing like warblers uh, a lot of the time. I'm not really sure exactly where they're going to pop up and um, be showing. So uh, deer is another great example when I'm walking through the woods just finding them. The exposures are going to change uh, quick and fast and um, from really dark areas to really light areas. So in those circumstances, having aperture priority set with auto ISO is a perfect combination for me. And the way that works is I set a minimum shutter speed for the camera to give me. So in this case, right now, you can see the setting was uh, 3 20th of a second. So I told the camera to never go below 1 3 20th of a second. <clears throat> and I was shooting wide open at f4. Uh, with that lens and then the camera just picks the ISO for me. So in this case it chose ISO 2000. Uh, here's another example. Um, in this case I told it to never go below 1 500th of a second and the camera automatically picked ISO 1250. And the reason this works for me is because uh, sometimes, you know, right now, like this kinglet that I'm showing, it popped out in this little shady area, but if it moved up to the top of these trees, the exposure could jump up two stops. Well, these birds are so incredibly fast that manually trying to change the settings can be cumbersome and I could miss the shot a lot of time. So in this circumstance, letting the camera choose it for me works really well. But I'd say probably about 75 to 80 percent of my shooting is done in manual mode because I'm usually in an area where I know I'm going to have consistent uh, lighting and consistent background and I want full control over that because I don't want the camera to guess wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a couple of comments, so I'm just going to take a moment to look at those, see if we have any questions to answer here. I see a question from Chris. He's asking us, what do we meter in the field to get an optimal exposure? Chris, normally what I do, if I expect to shoot a bird or a subject that's mid-tone, whether it's, you know, I don't know, light brown, whatever, um, I'll meter off of the tree, I can meter off of the grass, and then I have that exposure. So when the bird first passes through, I first start taking exposures, I'll use that as my baseline. And then I can adjust from there to taste and, and check my histogram as I was discussing before. Similarly, if it's a bald eagle, um, if I'm at Conowingo, for instance, there's that white sign across the river, um, you can expose off of that sign exposed with a highlight and you're going to make sure you don't blow the head on the eagle when you're shooting it. So it uh, depends on the subject. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I completely agree. Um, two more questions. Susan asks, if you're shooting in low light, is it better to push your ISO to get the histogram more to the right or is it better to underexpose to keep your ISO lower, which will give you less noise? So I sure. would say that kind of depends on the camera. Um, there's a new term that's being used lately called ISO invariant and what that basically means is um, there's not much of a difference in underexposing your image severely and pushing it up say three stops so let's say you underexpose the image three stops and then in post lighten it three stops versus um, pushing the ISO up three stops in the field and you get about the same results but not all cameras work that way um, I would say for me, my choice would be to try and get the exposure right. And if that means pushing my ISO up in the field, that's where I would go. I wouldn't necessarily rely on 
uh, purposefully under or overexposing an image and trying to recover that in post. Um, but you may find somebody that would disagree with that. And like we said earlier, if you end up with an image that accidentally got that way, maybe don't trash it and try and take a look in post and see what happens. Yeah, then, no, normally, what, yeah, yeah. Normally, normally what I'll do if I'm in a situation where, actually I was shooting a pygmy owl not that long ago, and this was in the blue hours post sunset, um, there was a little bit of light. I pushed my ISO as far as I could go in order to generate a sh shutter speed that was fast enough that I could freeze the subject That's and get a relative. That's a great relative. point. Yeah, you so wouldn't be able to get that from post. Yeah, sometimes you just have to operate in the field within the confines of getting a sharp image, and then you'll have to you know, make those trade-offs in post in terms of introducing noise through brightening the image and so forth. Certainly. And then there was one other comment. Someone was asking if we could talk about EV, and what I assume he means is uh, the exposure value, like uh, exposure compensation, and just pushing that around. Um, <clears throat> if you're shooting in manual mode, uh, you're really not concerned with that because you're controlling all three aspects of the exposure. But if you are doing this aperture priority auto ISO thing, uh, auto ISO thing like I do, uh, that does come into play. And you can see there's a couple of exposures here. Here I went plus a third of a stop. And then on this one I went plus two thirds uh, only because I knew that the background was a little bit lighter than my subject and my camera meter would naturally underexpose this bird just a little bit to maintain a proper exposure on the background. So just knowing that, I was able to just kind of push the exposure value up a little bit and uh, kind of correct that um, automatic exposure that the camera would actually give. So, uh, you know, that does come into play. I definitely use that and push that around a little bit when I'm shooting that way, but when I'm in manual mode, that's not really much of a concern. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see, a couple more questions here. Um, actually, it doesn't look like there's more questions, just some nice comments there, so thanks everyone for all the feedback. And let's see, so we talked about um, manual mode, and I talked about aperture priority and auto ISO, and Josh, I know we kind of had next that we wanted to discuss birds in flight and changing backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, one thing when it comes to manual mode, and the reason why I like to use it most of the time for wildlife subjects, um, essentially what I do when it comes to settings, I'll typically shoot wide open. So if I have a lens that can go to f4, I go to f4. If it's at 2.8, I'll use 2.8 if I'm in lower light settings and the like. So typically I'm shooting wide open, and I'm pushing my ISO as far as I can to ensure I have the fastest shutter uh, speed possible for any given moment and the reason for that is I always want to be ready for action I, I tell people this they say oh Josh you're crazy but I, if I could shoot every exposure at one eight thousandth of a second sure. I would do it <laughs> and here are some examples this is a short-eared owl that was just uh, perched in the middle of a field and it was chilling and I was you know taking some photos and the like uh, I think my ISO on this was 1600 or 2000 at the time and people were saying well Why is your ISO bump so high? I'm like well the birds gonna fly it was actively hunting and you know it was Sitting down for a few minutes looking around and then it was taken off So in this situation I had enough light where I probably could have been at ISO 200 But I pushed it so I had a fast shutter speed. I think this might have been 1 hundredth of a second uh, when the bird decided to lift off, I was able to capture that, and I got a tack sharp photo. Similarly, um, I'm shooting Godwitz, Marble Godwitz. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Uh, this was down in Virginia. Uh, I was with a friend of mine, Coram. We were shooting Marble Godwitz, and the Godwits are moving around. They're standing. They're doing some printing, and then this one did a wing stretch. You, you want to be ready with a fast shutter. You're hanging out along the water and an osprey decides to go on a fishing run right in front of you. You want to be ready with that fast shutter speed. You're photographing ducks. You could have a low ISO, again ISO 200, 400 and what have you. Maybe it doesn't generate a fast enough shutter speed. You have a beautiful canvas back that's just floating around in the water and all of a sudden it decides to do a wing flap. Having that ISO pushed, having a faster shutter, gives you the speed to capture that moment. Again, a crane. Uh, awesome light. Near first light. Thanks, Ray. Uh, this is a crane near first light. Um, it was just standing there. I could have been at lower ISO settings, but at, at the end of the day, I, was, I knew these cranes were eventually going to blast off. I was ready, and I was able to capture some of that action. 
Um, again, moving on with this uh, little blue uh, heron, um, it was just kind of standing there looking around, and all of a sudden, and folks who have seen waders, depending upon the waiter, when they decide to go in and fish, they can go very, very fast, yeah, and you need to be ready. So um, I always tell people this. I would much rather have a shot that captures action, that's tack sharp, that has some grain or noise that, you know, in with cameras these days, even crop bodies, you can control the noise in post, than have an image that's soft and doesn't have much grain. Of course, that image is unusable. I completely so, agree. Yeah, yeah. So what I will do is manual mode, again, normally shoot wide open, and I'll push my ISO as far as I can to generate the fastest shutter speed possible for any given situation. Yeah, and I would also <clears throat> say, um, you know, I think the right term may be not push it as far as you can, but as far as you're comfortable with for your camera and its noise property. So everybody has a different um, threshold where they like to push their cameras ISO to with an acceptable amount of grain. So, you know, knowing that value and how far you're willing to push it will kind of allow you to kind of stay on that upper range so you can keep that shutter speed up um, for the exact scenarios that Josh was talking about. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Exactly. Uh, take it right away with the blue hour exposures. Great. Um, so when it comes to exposing, a lot of folks will – the common, I, I think, perception out there amongst a lot of photographers that I see this, um, they'll set up and they'll begin taking exposures uh, right after sunrise. And in many cases, similarly, at the end of the day, they'll stop taking shots right after the sun goes down. There's this thing they call the blue hour, um, and it's basically, and it, 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 it's not always an hour, but it's a, it's a set amount of time that you have when you have light that's available to take exposures prior to sunrise and after sunset. These are more difficult exposures um, because you have you don't have a lot of light, so you have to push your ISO, and in many cases you're dealing with shutter speeds that are not as fast as you would like. So sharpness techniques are key here, uh, and many times you want to operate off of a tripod even for medium telephoto lenses, if you're shooting, you know, with Canon, I have a 100 to 400, you know, or even a 70 to 200, um, you want to make sure that your images are sharp. And the way to do that is to have proper sharpness techniques in terms of how you support your lens, because most likely you're shooting at very slow shutter speeds. Um, a few examples here, and these were all, this was prior to sunrise. This was a whitetail in Virginia, um, maybe, I don't know, just a few minutes before the sun came up. But, you know, when deer are in the rut, they'll go around and they'll they'll lick branches and sniff around. I thought it was kind of a great scene. If I decided to wait until sunrise, uh, when that golden light came out, I would have not walked away with this exposure. So I guess the point is don't be afraid to pull the trigger before sunrise. Don't be afraid to pull the trigger after sunrise. There's always opportunities available. Here's a great gray owl. This was before sunrise, just before the sun came up. You could actually see in the primaries of its wing here, uh, the left wing, um, you, you see a bit of red there at the edge of the primaries. That's actually the sun coming up. There was some sun that was, sun rays that were reflecting off of the snow against the owl. But this was right before the sun came up. The owl was actually hunting. Um, it, it, came, it was an amazing scene. This was uh, on the border of Manitoba near Canada. And this owl came down, and it was fantastic. Again, I was ready. I had a fast enough shutter to capture the action. And um, it was interesting, by the way, on this, we were shooting a rough grouse, which were in a tree just on the other side, and we turned, and this owl came down, and we got fortunate enough to capture it. So it wasn't baited. That's a whole separate topic. But um, again, before sunrise, osprey. Osprey, this was right before the sun came up. You kind of have those magenta tones on the river. Um, but again, I was able to have a fast enough shutter speed to capture the action. It was a fishing run. And I really like the color, actually, in this one, too. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, here's that pygmy owl I was talking about. This was in blue light. Uh, this was after the sun set. And, and thankfully, I had a tripod here. And he was actively hunting and bouncing around. And I was able to capture this guy. So I, I was pretty fortunate. We waited a long time to, to see that fella. Um, short-eared owl. This owl was perched um, in an open field. Sun went down for a little bit. This was probably a few minutes after the sunset. 
everybody packed up, they left. And I'm like, why is everybody going? I mean, this owl's <laughs> still here. And I liked the tones in the background, and I thought it, it worked out well. So uh, Sandhill Crane, Blue Hour, this was Bosque del Apache. This was a few hours after sunset. Everybody was gone, and I really liked the, uh, the color tones here. And you can see there's a little bit of wing blur there in the wings, and that's because I was Nothing operating. Yeah, it, it, it reflects motion. Certainly. Uh, and, you know, uh, also here we have a northern shoveler. This was only, I think, about two weeks ago. The sun was setting, and it set behind um, the horizon, but uh, the glow, um, you know, right after the sun, the sun went down, there was still some glow coming up and the there were some trees you could see the autumn foliage there it was reflecting off the trees and it just lit up the water beautifully i had to open the shadows up a little bit but again this was after the sun dipped down past the horizon and a lot of folks would just walk away from this stuff so i think the point is a uh, similar scene this was all going on that was the same duck and the water was just just lit up like gold um it was pretty amazing uh, similar concept here, Sandhill Cranes, Bosque del Apache, the sun set behind the mountainside, and you just had this this glow, and I was taking these silhouettes as these cranes cross the sky. Oh, that's nice. One last, yeah, one last thing here. Um, you don't even have to wait. You know, In some cases, uh, you can shoot past the blue hour. I was in Benazet, Pennsylvania. That's a famous spot where folks will go out, and they'll shoot um, the elk herd there. It's about 1,000. It's a pretty healthy elk herd. And everybody left, and I noticed some folks, the, the sun went down, um, everybody packed up and left, the photographers, and I noticed folks were coming with flashlights, and they were, I guess, elk spotting, if you will. We used to do that with deer when I was a kid. Sure. And I was like, oh, you know what, I'll hang around and see what it is, and I can get some cool stuff. So um, somebody was uh, had a flashlight on this fella, and I was able to get a photo. So um, even beyond... Um, the blue hour, uh, even throughout night, you can have some opportunities. So I think the point is here, they're tough exposures. Always try to um, expose to the right. You're gonna have slower shutter speeds, higher ISOs, but there's ample opportunity available out there. So um, don't restrict yourself to between, um, don't restrict yourself between sunrise and sunset. Yeah, and I'll just hit a couple of images I had real quick, uh, same example. So uh, Snowy Owl I found a couple of weeks ago uh, I arrived on the scene an hour before sunrise, and then I actually found this bird about a half hour before sunrise. And as you can see, it's got the same kind of pink and purple tones that show in the sky before sunrise, like Josh was talking about. And, um, Love you know, this one wasn't so much pushing the ISO really far, but it was more about dropping the shutter speed really low. So I wasn't even on a tripod. This was just with a monopod, and I got it down to 1 25th of a second at ISO 640. So... I was able to control that noise a little bit, uh, but with a stationary subject like that, uh, I had no problem trying to do that. Um, a scenario where uh, this was a, a flock of white pelicans in Florida, and the sun had actually set behind a building that they were all sitting on a dock in front of, so there was no longer any direct light on them, but again, you know, most people would, like Josh had said, would kind of walk away from that scene, and I found some interesting compositions to kind of work with in the really soft light there. Um, this is before yeah, sunrise again, <clears throat> pushing the ISO a little bit, 1600 ISO. Uh, like Scott in the uh, comments had actually mentioned, uh, both Josh and I are shooting full frame bodies, so in this case it was a Nikon D4S, and 1600 ISO is kind of nothing for that camera, so I was able to keep my shutter speed up at a thousandth of a second to get this red knot as it kind of walked across the beach searching for food and um, you know, I, it still has a great quality of light, even though there's not much quantity of light. And that's something to keep an eye out for, you know. Um, just because the sun has gone down uh, and there's not much light, sometimes the quality of that light can be amazing, even though there's not much quantity of it. Uh, and then last thing, uh, it's just another silhouette um, right uh, before the sun kind of came up as this deer kind of walked across an open hill, and I was able to get that. A uh, couple of questions. Um, David Moots asks, um, he's shooting with an Nikon D500, and he shoots in manual mode with the camera controlling the ISO automatically. And he asks if we're saying that controlling the ISO would be a better way to go in manual mode. So David, I would actually say if you're going to go manual, or I'm sorry, if you're going to use auto ISO, I actually prefer using the aperture priority method 
because you can tell the camera automatically what shutter speed to not go below and then excuse me it will pick the ISO for you and when it hits a uh, lower ISO it will actually start automatically kicking that shutter speed up for you so you don't have to really pay attention to that so you can kind of get higher shutter speeds um, without having to manually change them uh, and since you're kind of letting the camera dictate the exposure when you're doing auto ISO even though you're in manual mode it seems like it kind of makes sense to me to let the camera do a little bit more of the heavy lifting and have one less setting to worry about and uh, one last thing I'll mention with Nikon is you can turn on what's called easy exposure compensation and that lets you actually just rotate your back thumb wheel to control the exposure compensation without having to press any of the buttons so you can just kind of tell the camera go lighter go darker and uh, I find that combination works really good. Uh, that being said, if it's working for you and you're getting great results, stick with it. And let's see if we have any other questions here. Uh, bu -bu -bu. White balance was mentioned. Yeah, Adam actually answered that question in the comments. Uh, what white balance do we use for these blue hour, uh, kind of before sunrise photos? Um, I'm shooting in RAW, so I kind of don't really worry about the white balance. How about you, Josh? Yeah, I really don't. Um, normally, I shoot in auto white balance, and I'll correct. You know, if I want to make adjustments, I do it in post. One Same important here. thing to know though, when I shoot during the blue hour, um, normally you'll have a cyan. This not really as, as much white balance, but when it comes to color cast, uh, whites or highlights when you're shooting during the blue hour. Um, this is before or after sunset, or you're shooting whites and shade. They'll have a, a a cyan or a bluish tone to them, yeah. and normally have to do a color correction on the whites um, for that period. Certainly. Uh, let's get right into the golden hour stuff. Go for it, Josh. Great. Uh, not much to say here when it comes to exposures <laughs> yeah. other than um, it's it's an easy exposure in the sense you're going to have ample light um, and you, know, you want to expose to the right, generally speaking, and um, expose to taste. So, uh, you know, this is obviously the favorite time for most photographers when it comes to capturing wildlife. Um, you know, in, in many cases you could, you know, uh, for the folks who shoot, uh, not in manual mode, but in aperture priority, this is really where your can your metering, uh, in your camera, at least for Canon is smart and not that dumb. So typically, you know, if you're shooting, uh, without any, you know, zero compensation, you're pretty much hitting the mark. If you have bright whites, you're maybe down a stop or so. So just a couple of shots, um, to show this is golden hour stuff. Uh, this was a wood duck. Not, not far um, after sunrise. Um, love these birds. Indigo bunting. This was nice. shot near my, near my hometown. I'm from Pennsylvania. We don't get much sunlight in Pennsylvania, but when <laughs> we do, it's good for um, certain types of songbirds and birds that breed in fields and the like, and indigo bunting is one of those. Always a killer bird. This was uh, Minnesota. This is a great gray owl um, coming back up um, in, in just great light. I love those birds. Yeah, the light is amazing there. Great blue heron, uh, um, again, just, you know, great light, exposed to taste. Here's a northern, I've been shooting a lot of northern shovelers lately, as people can tell. Um, and we've all and, been jealous. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to get close to these guys. They're typically skittish, but sometimes it just takes a cup of tea. And uh, Canada warbler, um, another just great songbird. They breed uh, in um, dense understories and moist um large tracts of forest and they can be found in a lot of the uh, northern reaches of the uh, states and also up in Canada. Um, green winged teal, another just incredible duck, very hard to get close to, they're typically very skittish. Um, common terns fighting along um, some of the uh, barrier islands down there in Virginia. Nice. Nice. And uh, probably my favorite breeding bird when it comes to Pennsylvania, this is the golden winged warbler. An amazing bird. Uh, they were very numerous years ago in, in states like Pennsylvania and the like, but their numbers are dropping. They're being replaced by blue-winged warblers. No one really knows what's going on as far as the numbers go, why they're dropping why they're dropping so hard in the past couple of years. But it's an amazing bird. This was close to sunset. And um, green, uh, sorry, this is American Wigeon, again, close to sunset. But this one, nice. my nice. shutter speed was... Um, probably on the slower side, these birds are fast. They're songbirds when they flap, but slow enough to have a wing blur, which I thought was cool. It's a, probably a female cardinal. And um, this is a bobwhite in golden light. 
and I didn't, I didn't even plan on that rhyme, but it sounds good. Uh, oh. It was coming to, <laughs> uh, coming to a little uh, little pond to feed near near the end of the day. Um, Avocets foraging near sunset. Uh, this was um, what was it? This is a Black Lake Kitty Wake. This was on a huge uh, bait fish run up in Nome, Alaska, a couple years ago. It was pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, they're great birds. I've only ever seen them on uh, pelagic trips off the east coast, but uh, really, really neat gulls. And and here's that bird's bully. This is yeah. a parasitic gator, and they beat the crap out of those birds and rob their food. It's actually fun to watch. Some of the best aerial battles I've ever seen. Beyond watching peregrines, in my opinion, Jaegers are just special, special birds. Um, Northern pintail again. This was just after sunset. Um, and I took this one just a couple days ago. I think I took this Sunday. Uh, cormorant, again, close to sunset, and uh, I like the symmetry on this one. So, again, when it comes to golden light, uh, oh, and here we are. Uh, there we go. Um, a friend of mine in uh, the Allentown area, Pennsylvania, he's a gull specialist. He loves gulls. He really does. So, I've never seen anybody that likes him so much, but uh, he'll definitely like that shot. I know. They, they call them larophiles, um, which I think is an interesting term. That's for gull level uh, Goal lovers. I wasn't and, familiar um, with that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing I have to say, this is what a lot of people would consider a trash bird, but you watch goals long enough, they'll do interesting things. And um, I like the coloring of the gape here. And um, if you even work with common birds, you can come up with some cool exposure. I was just going to so. say, I think you're in the same camp as me in that if you can take a unique or creative photo of a common species, it's still a great photo. It doesn't matter kind of what the species is. Sometimes it's not worth overlooking them. Yeah, to totally agree, Ray. Yeah, let's talk about it. I got some examples lined up to, to go with your discussion here, so I'll let you kind of uh, hit this topic, Josh. All right. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, and this is beyond the golden hour, and again, I was talking during the blue hour, people will pack up and leave after the sun uh, goes down or, you know, they'll they'll just say, hey, this is it, the sun's set, I'm going, everything's done. And, you know, this happens also in similar situations. I call this purgatory light. It's, you know, an hour or so after you lose golden light in the morning and an hour or so before you get to the golden light at the end of the day. So you're kind of in between heaven and hell on both sides. Yeah. So that's, hence the name. I call it purgatory light. And really what that is is, and I'm going to use this, this really crappy photo of the moon I took not that long ago. Um, the point of this type of light is you're going to have situations when you come across subjects specifically that have bright spots or that have highlights or whites. In this case, I expose for the moon. And when I expose for the moon, um, because it's so bright, that highlight, if you will, the shutter speed is has to be fast enough to process that. So you have a faster shutter speed to process that light tone. And what that does is all the other mid-tones and darker tones in the image are essentially blacked out, if you will. Yep. Um, and it creates a very cool effect, I think, with certain birds. And a lot of these effects you can get, you know, you know, in the summertime, I'm getting some of these shots from like 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. where a lot of photographers are packed up. They're looking at the back of their LCD, looking at their warm uh, early sunrise shots, um, but they might be missing opportunities. And Here's I just an want example. to jump in real quick. Uh, one of the things you have to pay attention to during this time, though, uh, that's very important, is your background. So if you have a background that is just as light or getting as much sun as your subject, it's not going to work so well. So uh, continue on there, Josh. Yeah, excellent point, Ray. Um, and, you know, here's an osprey on a fishing run. And, again, you can see the bright whites. When I exposed for the bright whites and I got, you know, going back to the histogram again, I didn't want to clip it. I exposed as far to the right as I could. I was set. I was in manual mode. I had my settings. The bird came down, and what that does is the whites are exposed, and everything around it, the midtones and the like, just darken out. And I think it makes for a very cool effect. Um, this was along the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. Green heron again exposing for some of the the bright whites on the bird, and the bird was lit up, and everything around it gets darkened. And it just has a really, really neat look to it. It's very artistic. Some people call these low-key images and the like. I, I, I tend to like them. Uh, Northern shoveler. Again, we are here. We are with the shovelers. But I exposed for 
you could see with the breast and there was some light coming through and it lit the bird up. And again, you've got a lot of the mid and darker tones around it. And actually it, it leads your eye to the bird too, which is pretty cool. Certainly. Bald eagle on a fishing run, um, again, um, has that really neat effect to it. This was an American dipper, um, looking down at a rushing stream below these, um, out of these out of focus, uh, circles here, the bokeh, their water drops um, from the stream below. And again, a lot around the image gets darkened. This is an um, immature little blue heron flying. Great egret. Ah, here we are. You'd swear this is my favorite bird, northern <laughs> shovel. Um, and even beyond the purgatory light in midday, this is a landscape. This was down where was this? this was along the Rio Grande. This was an old Spanish missionary church. It was abandoned, but I probably took this, I don't know, 12, 31 o'clock, harsh light. So I guess the point is, you know, even beyond an hour after your golden hour or before your golden hour at the end of the day, you can even make exposures um, in harsh light. Black and white looks good for these types of things. So um, again, don't always think about getting in the car and checking your cool, warm images um, from sunrise to an hour after, there's opportunities available. Yeah, definitely. And I'll just jump in now with a couple of examples of these were definitely uh, a bit more harsh light than I would traditionally be shooting in. But uh, this oyster catcher was walking across this really shallow tidal pool and created a great reflection. So having the light, uh, the, the harsh sun kind of reflecting and bouncing off of the water actually filled in the shadows. And it was pretty flat light from behind, but, um, you know, finding a unique scene actually made this image work. And then uh, here's another kind of basically the same exact thing with a sanderling, uh, this, the wet sand, um, having the sun kind of bouncing right off of that. So the, neither of these shots were in kind of that ideal golden hour sunlight period. They were definitely uh, before or after it. And, uh, you know, just finding the correct sun angle and finding maybe some things that actually help to uh, bounce the light around can definitely help. And then actually, give me one second here. There's an image I don't have in this collection, but I just remembered that's a perfect example of I was actually kind of on just a scouting trip. Here we go. Uh, this was taken at, let's see, there we go, pretty much high noon in the middle of summer. So definitely not. Uh, an ideal lighting condition. Uh, I would almost never shoot in these conditions, but uh, with this snowy egret and it was really shallow water with light sand under the water, so between the surface of the water and that light sand and all the sun bouncing right up, it actually provided a decent amount of fill. And then here's a second image from that same scene and, uh, you know, the image actually works. So, you know, if you kind of work it right and really watch that light um, and watch your metering on this kind of stuff, uh, your exposures and, and get them just right, you can make this lighting uh, scenario work. So I'll hand it back to you, Josh. Sweet. Um, and let's talk a little bit about shooting on cloudy days. Um, there's certainly advantages when it comes to shooting on a cloudy day. The best advantage is you could shoot most of the day. Um, you don't have to pack it in and go home um, if you don't want to. A uh, couple things that I think I like to consider when it comes to exposures on cloudy days, um, high key images. I think they can, you know, if you plant right, come out really well. If you're not shooting in manual mode um, and you're shooting in aperture priority, for instance, um, you're gonna be pushing your exposure compensation on these. You're, you're plus one, plus two, yeah, um, de depending upon the lighting conditions. A uh, Couple other things I think that are interesting besides some high key opportunities when it comes to cloudy days, color saturation. Depending upon um, the uh, subject, if the subject's colorful and the conditions are right, you have a lot of midtones around, you can get some great color saturation on your subjects on cloudy days. Uh, also, birds that um, have black feathers or um, birds that have uh, um, shadowy dark areas, I think blacks can, um, can be exposed, I think, really well on cloudy days versus direct sunlight. So birds that have a lot of black, I'll, I'll show you some of these photos, I think do well on cloudy days. This is a American Avocet. This was on a cloudy day along a beach. It almost looks like it's kind of in a snowstorm, if you will. Um, and it kind of had a really, really cool effect. I like the, um, the coloring, the lake coloring here too, that kind of powder blue. 
I thought it looked really cool. Um, a lot of people like to shoot these birds in golden light. They look incredible, and especially in breeding plumage. But even during the winter, um, in the off season, and even during ugly cloudy days, you can come up with some cool stuff for avocets. Certainly. <clears throat> this is a northern gannet coming in with some nesting, um, I guess courtship materials, if you will, for its mate. Again, this was on a very cloudy day. This was probably taken around 1 p.m. Uh, ruddy turnstone. I took this along the Delaware Bay this past spring. Cloudy. This is probably 2 p.m. Um, you know, if it were a sunny day, I wouldn't be shooting this at all. Uh, new gull. This was, again, cloudy day, probably midday. I think that friend we were talking about would really like that. He would. He, he loves gulls. Um, I'll have to make sure I get him a print of that one. Uh, uh, bald eagle. This was probably 1 p.m. again on a cloudy day. Um, Wimbrel in flight. Love it. Midday. Uh, another gannet shot coming in with a few gannets in the background. This is amazing. Oh, I love them. They're so charismatic. And the uh, the veins on the feet have yes. that kind of – it reminds me of the green lures of kind of like a great, great egret. Yeah, just it great stands color. out. Uh-huh. Yeah, so cool. Um, elk. This was cloudy day. Um, this was Benazet. Um, getting back to some of the subjects that I think that have blacks in them that look good on cloudy days, one that really comes to mind is the hooded merganser. Yes. Um, a lot of folks, like if you look at, you know, this is my personal um, opinion, but you try to shoot gadwall and some types of ducks, they're just bland looking. I don't think, you know, some ducks look better in the, you know, on cloudy days. Birds that have black, I always think look better. Um, this is a good example: hooded merganser, black oyster catcher, and uh, Atlantic puffin. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. What the puffin? Yeah, are. this is a Pomeran Jaeger. Nice. Uh, this bird is so badass. Um, <laughs> these birds uh, breed in the high Arctic. This was taken near Barrow uh, on the north slope of Alaska. And they are bullies. Um, the, I've watched these birds beat the crap out of snowy owls. Snowy owls um, breed alongside them along wow. the tundra. These birds will come in and they'll 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 prey on the snowy owl chicks. I think they're just the more maneuverable in light or in the air as well. Yeah, I mean they're 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 beasts. They're so much fun to watch. Um, this is a razor bill. Again, look at the blacks on a cloudy day. If I had if I had direct sunlight or harsher light, and this was probably I don't know maybe early afternoon I, I would have never had that exposure yeah for sure um there is a question i just i did want to hit uh real quick and here i'll throw up a quick example of one of my i had the same exact situation you had josh uh i had razor bills and puffins and just some real soft muted it wasn't complete overcast but there was a little bit of direction to the light but it was so soft and muted that it uh, really gave me the details i needed in the blacks and whites on these uh razor bills and puffins um oh. So uh, Tracy asks about, and she was talking about when we were showing the uh, brightly lit subjects with the solid dark backgrounds. She asks if, um, uh, let's see the question, do you ever exposure comp, you know, use exposure compensation during those hours to balance the brighter light? So I answered her in the comments, but I did just want to say this in the video for anyone listening that I believe um, with those really dramatic backgrounds where the subject is getting lit really uh, brightly and the, the exposure difference to the background is so extreme, I think you almost have to go full manual and uh, take over the camera and to set those exposures proper. I think if you kind of let the camera guess at that, uh, you're just playing the odds if you're going to happen to get the exposure right because of the exposure difference from subject to background is so extreme, it's going to be really tough for the camera to nail that automatically. So I just want yeah, to answer that one quick. Totally agree, Ray. All right, cool. Uh, go ahead and uh, hit those songbirds. Yeah, and um, the last thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to exposing is for songbirds. And when it comes to songbirds, it's songbirds are different. Um, let me just say that. Uh, I am born and raised in Pennsylvania. I know Pennsylvania fairly well. Um, most of the Northeast United States, there's lots of tracks of forest and it's great for songbirds in order to, um, photograph songbirds, you need to find them first. And it's unique in the sense that I think you have to understand what type of bird you're going to photograph, what's their range, what's their habitat, 
there's no one hot spot for songbirds unless you're going to migration spots like Point Pelly and, and some of the others. But um, if you understand the habitat, the type of bird you're looking for, where the range is, you're most likely going to find that bird understanding their song. So, um, you know, in some cases you want to find shorebirds, you go to the migration stops along the coast. If you want to find, let's say, I don't know, a worm eating warbler, you have to understand that they like dry wooded hillsides. Um, and you look at the range, you try to find that, that type of habitat, you're probably going to find the bird. Um, it's very hard when you go into these forest tracks to find 10, 11, 12 different types of species all in one spot. They're spread out because each particular songbird has their preferred um, uh, habitat uh, and their preferred way of foraging. All that being said, let me just get into the exposure, um, what I do exposure-wise for these songbirds. I use flash a lot, and the reason is most songbirds, with the exception of some that breed in old fields and like early succession, second growth forests and the like, um, they're in the forest canopy. So you're in the forest canopy, um, and the best time, or in my opinion, the best type of weather to shoot them in is on a cloudy day. Same here. And, uh, you know, again, I'm from Pennsylvania. It's cloudy almost all year. <laughs> so you can pretty much shoot songbirds whenever you want there. Um, I shoot with flash for a couple of reasons. Um, you're shooting uh, on cloudy days. You should, for the most part. You're underneath the canopy. Um, you want to um, add a little bit of fill flash to lighten some of the shadows that might be in the scene in and around the bird and add a little bit of pop and catch eye, um, uh, catch light to the eye. If you take a, an exposure with flash and it looks flashed, then you're not doing it right in my opinion. Less is more when it comes to flash. So what I have, it's similar to this, this isn't my rig, but I found this picture online. I have a similar fra uh, flash bracket, I have it raised it's elevated um, above the lens in the camera. Uh, if you mount your flash on your camera and it's close to the plane of the sensor, most likely your subject's gonna get steel eye. We humans get red eye from flash. Uh, birds get this blue steel eye um, for whatever reason. I'm not sure why it's a different color. I believe I'm it's sure something to do with the shape of the um, iris and all that, actually. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Good to know. Um, so, when you're setting up your flash, a couple things, um, and this is for fill flash. Normally what I will do, I use uh, what's called through the lens. It's ETTL is the acronym. Um, there's two uh, types of settings for the most part. There's manual, where you manually control the power output. Um, this ETTL, what it essentially does is it, it, um, it reads the ambient light and it does a metering and then based upon the light available it does this reading it will spit out the amount of flash um, that should be in the scene based on the reading of the ambient light and in accordance with your exposure compensation and then, um, believe it or not let me just add in it actually fires two flashes so it fires a pre-flash that's almost imperceptible to us humans mm -hmm. um, and it actually reads that light back in through the lens and then adjusts the flash exposure accordingly to give you the proper setting based on all the rest of the settings that Josh is going to tell you. Yep, that's exactly right, Ray. Um, normally when I shoot uh, and I'm using uh, fill flash, uh, I normally start at negative three as far as the uh, flash exposure compensation goes. Um, I'll bring it down to negative two, maybe at times, you know, one and two thirds. I don't rarely ever would I be outside of that range. Again, less is more when it comes to flash. Yeah. I always make sure I have the high-speed sync on. If you don't have high-speed sync on, you're not going to be able to use the fill flash at faster shutter speeds. Most cameras, uh, with when you're using flash, the typical sync speed, I think, is maybe one, two... two 250. Two, 250, I think it is, right? Yep. Um, so if you don't have high-speed sync on, you're not going to be able to utilize the fill flash above that sync speed on your camera. So again, very important. It adds a little bit of catch light to the eye and adds a little bit of pop to your subject because for the most part, you're shooting under or within the forest canopy. Um, you want to shoot in cloudy conditions where you have soft, even light for these types of birds. Uh, also keep in mind with high speed sync, 
the way it works, uh, it's, which is kind of the way it works with all flash, but you know, uh, greater distances are definitely going to decrease your power. So, you know, you're not going to be photographing these songbirds, you know, a hundred feet out and getting adequate fill flash out of it. Uh, it's going to have to be within a certain usable range. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, and by the way, when it comes to the exposure on your camera, it shouldn't be any different. Um, you should be exposing for the ambient light. Yep. So, um, expose for the ambient light, push your histogram to the right, get that data in the fifth box if you can, um, and then set your fill flash through the lens. And some people may want to use manual. I don't typically do it because my subjects are moving around. But um, through the lens, high speed sync on, and typically start with negative three and then you know play around uh, to taste there. Nice. This is a winter wren. Um, it's not the, 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 the brightest bird or the most colorful. <laughs> it's one of the loudest. But, yeah, that's true. The, the song on this bird is absolutely incredible. Probably one of the best songs uh, of all songbirds. Wrens are just incredible singers along with thrushes and a few other um, different families of songbirds. But winter wren is just um, They just make a up beautiful... for their tiny size with a loud voice. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, this was in springtime. Uh, shot this in Pennsylvania which is the southernmost, I think, range of where these birds breed. They're more synonymous with northern reaches. Um, a lot of people have probably seen this bird. This is the northern flicker. Again, just a gorgeous woodpecker. Um, look at the breast spots and really, really just a beautiful bird. Again, these are cloudy conditions using fill flash. This is a female Blackburnian yeah. warbler. Might be my favorite um, wood warbler, uh, just a stunning bird. Even the females are stunning, in my opinion. Um, this is on a stunted spruce. I took this in Pennsylvania. These types of birds love um, northern hardwood forest tracks. In particular, they like hemlock, um, groupings of hemlock and white pine. You can find them in uh, just awesome birds. Again, you can see a little bit of catch light, a little bit of fill flash there, cloudy conditions. Um, set on a tripod. Boom. Quick question from Corey. Uh, he asks if you ever used the better beamer or other modification to extend the range of your flash. Oh yeah, good question, Corey. Um, yeah, I actually do use a better beamer most of the time. One of the things it, for what you just said, Ray, for that reason. Uh, also, um, it preserves the battery life of the flash. Also, when you're using a better beamer, uh, so that's also a good thing. So typically, I'll I'll use a better beamer. Um, to preserve uh, also the power on the flash because right. if you're not you're using more power and you're you know they, those things chew up battery life like Certainly. nobody's business yeah um, common yellow throat um, these are fairly common songbirds uh, along with yellow warbler and a few others um, is that yellow one with flash fill uh, yeah that's yeah right. that's awesome There's so a little bit of fill flash here yeah this you can was barely tell which is perfect yeah yeah less is more with flash this was um where was this? It was a marsh along the Patuxent River. This was down in Maryland. I took this. This is uh, um, his impression of Jean-Claude Van Damme, if anybody saw that <laughs> <before>. commercial. That's <laughs> all awesome. long ago. Uh, Chestnut-sided warbler. Handsome. Great bird. Love these birds. It's interesting. You know, these birds were very few and far between when Audubon was um, uh, you know, exploring the country years and years ago because these birds like early succession forests, brushy fields and after you know everybody most of the forest tracks in the northeast were chopped down all the old growth forests as all these new successional forests and fallow fields and habitats came up these birds became numerous i mean there there's tons of them around which is good to see but it hurts other species as well um orchard oriole this was taken along the susquehanna river in pennsylvania very charismatic cool looking birds again cloudy day a little bit of flash this is Anna's Hummingbird. I took this on the West Coast. Um, a buddy of mine showed me a good spot for these birds out there. Just um, beautiful, beautiful hummingbirds. And again, a little bit of fuel, uh, fill flash to light up the gorget, I think that's how they say it. Oh, nice. Um, yellow warbler, great bird. Um, these guys like willow thickets, streamside creeks, brushier areas, um, cloudy day, a little bit of flash. Looks awesome. Black-throated green warbler. This was obviously on a cloudy, beautiful day, rainy day in Pennsylvania. 
Um, this you could see some of the the water drops here. This was red spruce. Yeah, this is on a red spruce tree, and uh, you can see some of the water drops there. Again, a little bit of flash um, exposed to the right. Cloudy conditions. Um, black throated blue warbler. Oh God, I love this. I love that pose. Yeah. Yeah, just foraging, actively foraging. Yeah. Um, in this was Pennsylvania again. This was this past spring. Um, cloudy conditions again. A little bit of flash. Black and white warbler um, singing, uh, climbing a tree. Uh, Pennsylvania. This was springtime as well. Um, Red-breasted sapsucker. Wow. I took this. Yeah, absolutely stunning, stunning woodpeckers. Uh, one thing about woodpeckers, I think if you live out west, the woodpeckers out there are just there's prettier species, frankly, than there are yeah. um, the east coast. So they're a little spoiled out there, especially in Oregon and some other places around the Cascades. But um, this was just a striking bird. Um, I took this in the parking lot of a, a little park. Yeah, and awesome. Got lucky. Um, yellow-throated warbler. These guys like loblolly pine. The um, they're cones. yeah, I like the framing with the pine cones. They're some warblers are, um, you know, they're more southerly in persuasion. This is one of them, yellow-throated, yeah. along with Perry, Kentucky, and a few. Again, cloudy day, a little bit of flash. And uh, I think this is the final image. This is a hermit thrush, um, cloudy day. These uh, birds like the forest floor. This guy was perched on a mossy log. Uh, this was in Pennsylvania and bouncing around. A um, little bit of flash. You could see the catch eye there. Nice. The catch line. Perfect. All right, great. great. So I do want to mention to any of you warbler shooters or hopeful warbler shooters, um, if you don't have a flash set up, it's certainly possible to make it work without flash. Uh, I did kind of my first um, real strong warbler season this past spring, and um, I didn't shoot flash for any of them. So my settings with all of these are aperture priority, auto ISO, kind of like I was just talking about uh, earlier, um, because of those reasons, uh, just like Josh had mentioned with these warblers, they're kind of bouncing around. You never know exactly where they're going to be. So you're not in a uh, very consistent lighting scenario. So uh, letting the camera do some of that work for you while you're just trying to maintain focus and composition is definitely a helpful thing. Um, but what I will say with, out, with, with not using a flash uh, for warblers is it, you, might, you probably got to work a little bit harder just because um, you're not able to get really nice lighting in all the different spots they're going to land. So you're a little bit more dependent on them landing in an area that has some good light that, to work with. Whereas if you have a little bit of fill flash, uh, if they land on a nice perch with a nice background and you can provide that little bit of pop with that flash, that probably is going to give you a little bit more opportunity uh, to get some of those great warbler photos. But I'll just run through a handful of some of the shots I got this past spring here, uh, just so you can see some examples of uh, without flash warbler stuff. And uh, I just don't want you to be entirely discouraged if you don't have that set up yourself. Yeah, one thing I'll also say as you're scrolling through these images, Ray, um, when it comes to flash, what I'll typically do as well, um, in some of the most of these songbird shots I was shooting with the 1DX mark, uh, the first, the original 1DX. Okay. And that's 12, 12 frames a second. Yeah. I'll normally half that, and I, and I slow. Um, there's a speed where it's not high-speed uh, high continuous. Yep. I slow that down. I think it's, oh, geez, is it? I think it's maybe five frames a second or six or whatever. It halves it. And the reason is... Um, the flash has to recycle and sure. repower. If you're, you know, laying down the hammer uh, on 12 frames a second, only a few frames um, of a particular set will have flash. So what I'll do is I'll, 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 you know, lower that shutter count, and that enables my flash to recycle. And I, and most of my exposures will have flash in them. What you don't want to do is get your bird tack sharp when it's singing; it's perfect, and you didn't have flash on the bird. If that's yeah, that that's was true. Your that's true. Something to keep in mind. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. Anything else you want to chat about, uh, Josh? I'm pretty good. No, no. Excellent. Um, you know, uh, the only thing that, you know, we went through all these different, you know, lighting situations throughout the day. I guess the gist of it is, you know, depending upon the weather, depending upon the day, you can shoot pretty much any part of the day and come away with good exposures as long as, you know, you're watching your histogram. And you understand um, all, and use all these tools to your advantage. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, perfect. Uh, 
Josh, thanks so much. Um, you gave us a ton of great info. It was really great having you today. So thanks for taking the time. And I'm sure everyone certainly appreciates it, especially all your uh, Flash Warbler stuff. We've had some requests for quite a few of these talks to uh, discuss a little bit of Flash use for wildlife. So thanks so much for all your help. Great, appreciate it, Ray. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, thanks so much. Um, I just want to mention real quick, uh, we have our next discussion. We'll, Scott will be back for the next one, and we're actually going to do a live uh, critique of others' photos. So um, hit up my profile, my Ray Hennessy profile on Facebook, and you should see a post about how to submit your photo to get it critiqued uh, live on the next Facebook Live video. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, I think in about a week or so we'll be back with the next one. Thanks, guys.